Hello, I'm Miss Hibbler, and today we'll, we will be looking at a few passages from the book, The Birth of Venus. The Birth of Venus was written by the author and historian, Sarah Dunnant. She writes from the perspective of a young girl, the daughter of a fabric merchant during the Renaissance period. This book is a forbidden love story between the daughter of the fabric merchant Alessandra and a painter that comes to her family home. But it also gives us insight into the many complexities of the Renaissance art period in Florence. There may be some terms throughout the passages that you may not be familiar with. Let's start with the term frescoes. A fresco is a painting done on top of layers of wet plaster with pigment and water. The pigments soak into the wet plaster and as it dries, it becomes permanent. So it is also waterproof and has lasted through these centuries. Next is a merchant. A merchant is a person or company that trades and sells goods to people around the world, or to people or different regions. They're somewhat like the early business people. Next is the palazzo. The palazzo is a derivative of the word palace in Italian and is a large building like a museum or residence, especially in Italy. Finally is the Annunciation. The Annunciation was a popular image depicted by many artists during the Renaissance period and is a depiction of the biblical mo moment of the angel Gabriel telling the Virgin Mary that she would conceive and birth the baby Jesus. So before we read, we will be filling out a KWL. A KWL is a type of graphic organizer that divides what you want, what you know already before reading, what you would like to know, and what you've learned after reading. So first, let's start with what you know. Write down anything that you may know about the Renaissance Florence, anything that comes to mind. Next, write down what you want to know. What do you hope to learn through this, these excerpts about Renaissance Florence? Finally, let's get started reading. The chapel in our palazzo had recently been com completed and for some months he had been searching for the right pair of hands to execute the altar frescoes. It wasn't as if Florence didn't have artists enough of her own. The city was filled with the smell of paint and the scratch of ink on the contracts. There were times when you couldn't walk the streets for fear of falling into some pit or mire left by constant building. Anyone and everyone who had the money was eager to celebrate God and the Republic by creating opportunities for art. Let's stop there. What's something that you noticed that the author described and what Florence was like during the time of the Renaissance and rebirth? Write some of those words that you may recognize down on the on your piece of paper. Some words that may have jumped out were the smell of paint and the scratches of ink on the contracts. There's constant building and everyone was eager to celebrate God and the Republic by creating opportunities for art. Moving on, what I hear described even now as a golden age was the sim simply the fashion of the day, but I was young then and like so many others dazzled by the feast. The churches were the best. God was in the very plaster smeared across the walls in readiness for the frescoes. Stories of the gospels made flesh for anyone to, with eyes to see. And those who looked saw something else as well. Our Lord may have lived and died in Galilee, but his life was recreated in the city of Florence. The angel Gabriel brought God's message to Mary under the arcs of Brunelleschi and Logia, and the three kings led processions through the Tuscan countryside, and Christ's miracles unfolded within our city walls. The sinners and the sick of Florentine dress, and the crowds of witnesses dotted with pub public faces, a host of thick-chinned, big-nosed 
dignitary staring down from the frescoes onto their real life counterparts in the front pews. What were some important aspects of life to the Florentine people that the author focuses on throughout this passage? Yes, definitely religion. Religion was a huge part of the art in Florence, the rebirth of the birth, the rebirth during the Renaissance. The people would recreate these images that we know to have been in Galilee, as the author writes, but they recreate it in a way to depict it as part of the Florentine city. Next, we move on to a look into Alessandra's life. Alessandra is not allowed to spend time with the painter because of their different class and because she was an unwed girl. So this is a part where Alessandra inquires of the painter to her mother. How is the painter doing, Mama? I said after a while. No one has seen him since he came. She glanced up at me sharply, sharply and I thought of her maidservant in the courtyard. Surely not. The encounter had taken place weeks before. If she had seen me, I would have known about it before now. I think it has not been easy for him. The city is raucous after the silence of his abbey. He has suffered from the fever, but he's recovering now and asked to be given leave to study some of the city's churches and chapels before he continues with his designs. I dropped my eyes in case she should notice a spark of interest. How could he, how could, he could always come with us to service, I said, as if the matter not a jot to me. He, he would get a better view from certain frescoes from our position. Unlike some families who frequented only one church of worship, we had been known to spread our favors around town. This afforded my father the opportunity to see how much of Florence is wearing his latest fabrics and allowed my mother to enjoy the art as well as compare the preaching, though I doubt either of them would have admitted to it. Alessandra, you know very well that you would not be, that would not be fitting. I have arranged for him to make his own way. At nightfall, Alessandra is walking about, unable to sleep. From the side of our house, a figure emerged into the main street, his body briefly illuminated in the glow of the torches. He was long and lanky, with a cloak pulled tight around him, but his head was bare, and I caught that certain flash of whiteness in his skin. So, our painter was going out into the night. He would see little enough art at this hour. What was it my mother had said? that he was finding the city raucous after the stillness of the abbey. Maybe this was his way of sucking in silence. Though there was something in the manner in which he walked, head down, eager to lose himself in the dark, that spoke more of purpose than atmosphere. I was torn between curiosity and envy. Was it that simple? You wrapped yourself in a cloak, found the right door, and just stepped out into the night? If he moved fast enough, he could be at the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore in 10 minutes, then cross by the baptistry and head west towards Santa Maria Novella, or south to the river, where you may be able to hear the chatter of women's little bells. Another world. Let's pause. What was the main character, Alessandra, how was the main character Alessandra treated, and what was expected of her by her family? Write down anything you've noticed through this excerpt. The next day, Alessandra is sitting for the painter to study for her, his painting. This is set in the church on their property. In its raw state, the room has little of God about it. He had cordoned off a small part of the nave, the head of the church, where the sunlight comes through the side window, falling directly in a broad band of gold. He himself sits in the shade by a small table, um, which is paper, pen, pen and ink, and some newly sharpened stalks of black chalk. I come in slowly with old Ludovica behind me. He stands up as we come in, his eyes on the ground. Ludovica's gouty age makes us progress slow, and I have already asked for a comfortable chair to be placed for her nearby. At this time of day, it will only be a matter of time before she falls asleep. 
then no doubt forgets that she has done so. She is of invaluable assistance to me during such moments. If he remembers our last meeting, he does not. Sh he sh he does nothing to show it. He gestures me to a small dais in the light, with a high-backed wooden chair placed at an angle so that our eye line will not cross. I take a step up, already self-conscious about my height. I think we are as nervous as each other. Shall I sit? As you wish, he mumbles, still not looking at me directly. I arrange myself in a pose I have seen from the woman in the chapel portraits. Back straight, head high, and my hands folded across my lap. I am not sure what to do with my eyes. For a while, I look straight ahead, but the view is dull and I drop my gaze to the left, from where I can see the lower half of his body. The leather at the bottom of his hose, I notice, is badly worn, but the shape of his leg is good, if a little long, like my own. As I sit there, I become aware of the odor of him, much stronger this time, an earth smell mixed with sourness, almost kind of rotting about it. It makes me wonder what he has been doing the night before to have such a stench upon him. Clearly, he does not wash enough. It is something I heard my father remark about foreigners. But to draw attention to this now would stop any chance we might have of conversation. I resolve to leave it to Pop, Flautila, my sister. The stink will almost certainly drive her mad. Time passes. It's warm there under the sun. I glance up at Ludovica. She has brought some embroidery and is still sitting, that is still sitting on her lap. She puts her needle down and watches us for a while, but she has never shown much interest in art, even when her eyes were good enough to see it. I count slowly to 50, and by 39, I hear her breathing start to rumble in her chest. In the silence of the chapel, she sounds like a great cat purring. I turn to look at her, then glance across at him. In today's light, I can study him better. For a man who has spent the night wandering the city, he looks well enough. His hair is brushed, and if it its style is so long, too long for current Florentine fashion. It is still thick and healthy, his complexion even paler against its richness. He is long and thin like me, but it is less of a fault in a man. He has broad, fine cheekbones, and his eyes are almond-shaped and of almost a marble effect, gray-green flecked with black, so that I am reminded of a stare of a cat. He is not like any other man I have seen before. I do not even... I do not even know if he's good looking, though that may more be more to do with the way he keeps himself hidden inside. Apart from my brothers and my tutors, he is the first man I have ever been in such close proximity to, and I can feel my heart thudding inside my chest. At least sitting, I am less like a giraffe, though I am not sure he notices. While he is looking at me, he doesn't seem aware of me at all. The light shifts around the dais to the intermittent scratching of chalk on the page each line careful, considered, the rest of a singular communion between the eye and the hand. It is a vibrant kind of silence that I am familiar with. I think of all the hours I've spent in a similar pinpoint concentration, my fingers bent around a sharpened pebble or black chalk, trying to capture the head of a sleeping dog on the stairs, or a strange ugliness of my own naked foot, and it makes me more, more patient than I might otherwise have been. My mother says you've had the fever, I say at last, as if we were relatives who had been talking for an hour and just fallen silent that very second. When it is clear he is not going to answer, I think about bringing up his nocturnal wanderings, but I can't decide what to say. The sound of his chalk continues. I move my eyes back to focus on the chapel wall. The quiet is now so profound, I begin to think we will be here, we will be here forever. Though eventually Ludovica will wake, then it will be too late. You know, if you are to succeed here, painter, you may have to speak a little, even with women. His eyes flicker to one side so that I know he takes the words in, but even as I say them, they seem too crude and I feel embarrassed for myself. After a while, I stir in my seat, shifting my pose. He stops, waiting for me to be still again. I make a little noise. The more I try for stillness, the more uncomfortable I feel. I stretch myself further, he waits again. Only now I'm alert of the possibilities of mischief. If you will not talk, I will not sit properly. As I settle, I bring my left hand up in front of my face, deliberately obscuring his view. Hands, they are always difficult, so bony, yet fleshy at the same time. Even the greatest of our painters have trouble with them. Yet immediately he's drawing again, 
this time such intense scratching that the noise makes me hungry for paper. After a while, I get bored with my failure and put my hand back into my lap, flexing my fingers upwards until they stand up like a monstrous spider legs upon my skirt. I watch the knuckles go white and see a single vein throb up against the skin. How strange the body is, so full of itself. When I was younger, we had a tartar slave girl, a fierce character who suffered from fits. When they came upon her, she would fall rigid on the ground in spasm, her head flung back so far that her neck strained and stretched till it looked like that of a horse and her fingers clawed at the floor. Once she made foam come out of her mouth and we had to put something between her teeth so she did not swallow her own tongue. Luca, who I now think was always more interested in the devil than God, believed that she had been entered by a demon, but my mother said she was ill and should be left to recover. My father told her later, though I am not sure that he was entirely honest about her health. Even if it was illness, it could have easily passed for possession. If one had to paint Christ casting out devils, she would have made a perfect model. Ludovica is snoring loudly. It will take a thunderbolt to rouse her. It is now or never. I stand up. May I see what you've made of me? I feel his body go rigid. I can see he wants to hide the paper, but he also knows it would not be proper. What can you do? Pick up his equipment and run out? Attack me again? He would not be on a mule back to the northern waste if he had done that. And underneath all the silence, I did not think he was stupid. My courage deserts me at the table edge. He's so close, I can see the dark stubble on his face and the sweet rain smell on him. He's acute now. It makes me think of the decay and death, and yet I remember his violence from the time before. I glanced nervously at the door. What would happen if someone came in? Maybe he was thinking the same thing. In one awkward movement, he pushes the board across the table face up so that I can see it without moving any further towards him. The page is filled with sketches, a study of my full head, then parts of my face, my eyes, the lids half lowered, in a manner caught between shy and sly. He has not flattered me, as I do sometimes with Plautula as a way of buying her silence when she sits for me, but instead I am myself, alive with both mischief and nerves, as if I cannot speak but cannot stay silent. Although he knows, already he knows more of me than I do of him. And then there are the sketches in my hand held up to my face, palm and back. My fingers rounded like columns of living flesh, from nature to the page. His skill makes me giddy. Ah, I say, and there is pain as well as wonder in my voice. Who taught you this? I look at my fingers again, real and drawn, and I want more than anything to see how he does it, to watch the way each mark goes into the page. For that alone, I would risk being closer. I look at his face. If it is not arrogance, it has to be shyness that keeps him so silent. What must it be like to be so shy that you find it hard to speak? It must be difficult for you here, I say quietly. I think if I were you, I might be homesick. And because I do not expect him to reply, it registers like a small thrill inside me to hear his voice, which is softer than I remember. It's the color. Where I come from, everything is gray. Sometimes you can't tell where the sky ends and where the sea begins. The color makes everything different. Oh, but surely Florence is as it must have been then. I mean, the Holy Land, where our Lord lived, and that sunlight. That's what the Crusaders tell us. Their columns must have been as bright as ours. You should visit, visit my father's warehouse sometime. When the bolts of cloth are finished and stacked together, it's like walking through a rainbow. It strikes me that this is probably the longest speech that has ever, he has ever heard from a woman, I feel the panic rising in him again and remember his earlier wildness, the way his whole body had shaken in front of me. You mustn't worry about me, I blurt out. I know I talk a lot, but I am only 14, which makes me a child rather than a woman, so I simply, I cannot possibly harm you, and besides, I love art as much as you do. I put out both my hands and lay them gently on the table between us, spreading my fingers loosely on the wood so there is both tension and relaxation in the pose. Since you were studying hands, perhaps you would like to have record of them resting? They are easier to see than in my lap, and I think my mother would have approved of the humility in my voice. I stand very still, eyes lowered, waiting. I see the board slide off the table and a crayon move from nearby. When I hear its sounds on the page, I risk looking up. I can only see the paper as a slant, but it is enough to watch it take shape. 
Dozens of tiny fluid strokes raining down onto the page. No time for thought or consideration. No breath between the seeing and the doing. It is as if he is reading my hands from under the skin, building the image from the inside out. So at this point um, in the passage, could you see what could you see how were social norms different for people of separate classes, genders, and races? Next, let's finish our KWL. Think of something that you learned or something that surprised you and write it down. Now, after reading this passage, the author uses very descriptive terminology in the way she talks about Florence. So you can either, one, draw an image in your sketchbook of what you might imagine this Renaissance world to look like. You can choose a setting from any part of the book. Or two, you can write a journal entry from the perspective of a fresco wall using this raft guideline. So you will take the part of a fresco wall being prepared for yet another artist to smother you in plaster and start painting. You're writing in your journal, recording your day as a Florentine wall, and you have freedom in choosing an option of how, um, what you decide to write about. It can be about the process of the fresco, which is pretty tedious and long, or it can be about anything that you've seen during the day, some, something or someone that you saw as a wall. I hope you've been able to learn a little bit more about the world in Renaissance Italy. Thank you.